Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, What is the Future of Community Engagement and Planning? My name is Lucy Wakeford. I'm the head of online at Digital Leaders, and it's my pleasure to be chairing this session. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd firstly like to quickly recap the topic to give anyone who might be running late a chance to join. In this session, you will learn how the Planning for the Future white paper can put ongoing and meaningful public consultation at its heart. Peter and Rosa will present the findings of the National Public Opinion Polling in Qualitative Research, as well as data collected in the course of over 1,000 planning engagements run on the Commonplace platform. This evidence has guided the design of principles that can be applied to every plan making project to achieve the government's goals. The second thing I'd like to do is to let you know how to ask a question, which we encourage. Please enter the question in the Q&A window and I'll collect the questions during the presentation to ask in the Q&A in the last 15 minutes. The session will be fully recorded for you to watch back at a later time and share. I'd now like to introduce Peter Mason and Rosa Bolger, who will be taking us through today's webinar. Peter is the leader of Ealing Council and is an elected councillor for Southern Green, where he previously led the authority's work on housing, planning and transformation and serves on the OPDC planning committee. He holds a master's in urban regeneration from the Bartlett and is a frequent voice on the themes of power, trust and participation within the built environment. Rosa Bulger is the public sector leader at Commonplace. She brings a vast experience of working in local government from large boroughs down to small and rural town councils and community groups. Rosa is also an elected councillor and former town council leader. Before joining Commonplace, Rosa spent 10 years working in the television industry, writing, producing and directing television, for some of the UK and USA's largest networks before transitioning into the world of digital tech. So Peter and Rosa, over to you. Thanks so much and thanks so much for having us and, and for everyone for attending. Um, so uh, I guess just for a bit of con context, I'll, I'll start off by telling you a little bit about um, Commonplace. So for those of you who don't know, um, Commonplace is a digital platform uh, engaging over three and a half million people in online conversations about the places that they really care about. It makes consultations easier for everyone, whether that be planners, developers and also the community. As well as delivering high response rates, it collects robust data, handles information securely, and produces time and reputation saving insights and reporting. We host both plan making consultations for local authorities and engagements for planning applications, both in the public and the private sector. Um, so far, we've reached, um, sorry, so far, we've supported over a thousand projects across the UK, um, reaching, as I said, uh, three hundred, three and a half million people. Um, and we're currently in the process of expanding internationally. Um, our focus today is um, our planning for the future uh, report or, or our engaging for the future report in response to the, the government's planning for the future white paper. Um, at this point, I'd like to bring in uh, Peter. Peter, as the leader of Ealing Council, um, has been very involved with us. And so, Peter, I suppose that the main question is why this report and why now? Thanks very much, Rosa. And um, it really is great to be here. Um, I think, you know, full disclosure and, and to give you the context, um, I've sort of taken over as the leader of the London Borough of Ealing just recently. Um, but until then, was the head of uh, public at Commonplace. Um, so we're sort of intimately involved in um, the publication of this report, but also uh, really discussing the themes of uh, planning reform, um, the white paper, and really thinking about how uh, digital technology enables local authorities to sort of really connect with communities around sort of really difficult conversations about, about place and urban change. And um, really where the planning for the future white paper came from, or sorry, the engagement for the future white paper came from, uh, was in response to the government's agenda and we sort of, of course now have um, the planning bill coming forward and, and really when we sort of took, took a look at that uh, white paper we thought to ourselves that there are some absolute strengths um, in that discussion around empowering local communities to be more contact and more connected to change that sh that's happening around them um, uh, I'm sure many people inside the planning system know of the difficulties of taking a local plan through the statutory consultation process and perhaps the lack of widespread engagement that can happen um, in issues, options and regulation 18 and 19 consultations, perhaps 
and unre unrepresentative conversations um, when we can really find ways of engaging far more people in uh, conversations about change. Um, and also partly the government's intentions on development management. Um, and if the conversation is going to shift to sort of once in every seven or 10 year conversations about change, how do we then ensure that people have ongoing and active engagement in the conversations that happen on a development by development uh, basis? And so really we came forward to think about all the projects and things that we've been involved in over the last seven years um, and to layer that on top of not just the data that Commonplace collected, uh, but also getting out and talking to sort of people in the real world um, to see uh, what their thoughts and opinions were in terms of how they engaged in planning. And so we worked with the public affairs firm, Public First, um, who people will know are very involved in, and have been involved in some of these themes and topics before, particularly with government, um, to talk to communities for whom there's a lot of focus right now in parts of um, the North, uh, in parts of the so-called Red Wall, um, where the levelling up agenda is so important. Um, and we worked over a period of time to really dig into the thoughts and opinions of uh, a, a national opinion poll, um, but also some focus groups as well to sort of really flesh out some of those themes. Um, and really then using the seven years of data that Commonplace had collected uh, to see what lessons that we could learn in terms of the best ways of engaging, uh, engaging the public. Thanks, Peter. Um, and to just go through some of the headlines of our findings. So although here at Commonplace, um, we're supportive of much of the government's white paper, we don't think it goes quite far enough on engagement. Um, there's a great ambition, but the mechanics and the timing on how engagement will work doesn't currently stack up. So from our research, we found that the planning system needs to view engagement as a conversation and not just as a survey, or if you like, a process rather than an event. We found that longer continuous public engagement is beneficial to all stakeholders, um, in whether that be um, the public, developers or planning authorities themselves. Uh, it's only possible to see how engagement can work in this way if this takes place throughout the planning life cycle. And this may be five to 10 years or it may be over a shorter period, but it's just about doing it as a process and not just a one off event. There's a huge um, appetite for long term involvement in planning, and this is something we learned from the research we did. Um, so how, do, how does the research really support this? So, first of all, there, um, there is this genuine appetite to be involved. 76% said that they should be given a greater say, but also that they want to be involved continually, with 71% saying they want regular updates on planning issues. So there is a demand for a more strategic input. And the fact that 59% of people hadn't known what to expect, as you can see here, um, is a problem. And when, we, and when we've just heard that 71% want those regular updates, um, half of our sample think that developments in their area are misaligned to what people actually want. And both of these po point towards a demand for strategic input People want to know and want to be involved in these big strategic decisions in the places they love. But the question is, how? How do we do this? So here's an example. Um, use of Commonplace by Leeds City Council on their transport strategy um, is a great example of really moving the dial on the scale and constructiveness of engagement. Conversations have been had both citywide and also about neighborhood based changes over more than two years, and they resulted in 65,000 responses. It enabled the council to really build up a deep understanding of community need and expectations for, the infrastructure, for their infrastructure investment, taking people from the very local to, 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 to strategic feedback that has informed their future plans. Leeds is one of the councils to take advantage of the offer we made at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, which fortunately was taken up by over 50 local authorities, providing over 300,000 responses across the UK, a demonstration of how the pandemic has created a new energy among communities to really be part of what's going on in the area they live in. But of course, there's clearly barriers to engagement. And the questions we ask throughout our research is, is what are these barriers? And is there anything in our data that can suggest solutions to these barriers? 
you can see here that only 27% of the people we, we uh, did our research with had ever taken part in a planning cons consultation. So we thought that was important to ask them why. So given, uh, given the first barrier we found to be lack of accessibility and awareness, um, and what we've noted beforehand, 48% said that they had never been aware of a local consultation and 70% had never participated. Contrast that with Commonplace, where three and a half million people have engaged digitally to over a thousand projects. And this is just on Commonplace alone. So digital, digital can really open up a, what, this way of meeting this demand. The second barrier is really about motivation and attitude. So in our research, we see 27% who had taken part in the planning decision. And of those who had engaged, twice of, as, as many of them had done so to, to object than those who had joined a public meeting. Current engagement is not only, no, not only low, but it's often negatively motivated. But on Commonplace, what we've seen is not only those large numbers of people engaging, but also a very constructive set of responses with 66% of people actively supportive or neutral in response to the plans that they were asked to consult on. What people perceive and what people want from their perception in planning is also another barrier. So our research showed that, the, that, that people perceive their influence through the planning system as very, very low. So only 27% thought that local people had the greatest influence. But local people themselves actually van value the opinions of their neighbours, and that was very high. So 75% said that they would listen to a residents association and 70% to their neighbours. This is way ahead of councillors at 57% and local MPs at just 48%. So there's a gulf between what people would like and what people perceive their influence to be and people want to know the views of those around them. So given what we've just seen, it's little surprise that over half of our poll said that planning said, believed that planning decisions had been taken in secret to avoid a public backlash. But the trend we see over and over again on Commonplace is that digital engagement is great for delivering that social proof through transparency. When they see other neighbours taking part through our visible commenting, people are twice as likely to contribute themselves. Digital engagement can really harness the public's need to see this social proof and that the engagement is trusted and therefore encouraging more participation. So another example of this is, is the work we did with Blackpool. Um, so despite the pandemic, um, Blackpool Borough Council used Commonplace to run a public dialogue about Blackpool's future. They received over 3,600 contributions from 1,600 people in just six weeks. 70% of them expressed positive support for the themes of the town's investment plan. And only 10% of people... Have we got over thirds of online responses via mobiles which has been really similar across all of our projects and really interesting to see. The openness allowed residents to see contributions by their neighbours and agree or propose alternatives, adding to this real sense of trust and transparency. So Peter, you mentioned um, when you spoke before um, about uh, the levelling up agenda and, and particularly what's happening up in the north. Um, so the government has made it really clear that, this, that, that there is a levelling up agenda for the whole of the UK. So how do you see us using technology to support this? You know, part of the challenge that I think um, we all face now, and I think particularly that's been underlined by um, the pandemic and the sort of situation in lockdown, is that so much of our everyday lives has migrated online. Um, our socialisation, the way that we uh, receive media, um, the way that we access news, the way that we um, interact with our friends and family. And we already know that there are so many debates about the built environment. There are so many debates about sort of um, the public space moving into um, online areas and online um, forums. And at the moment, um, particularly as a consequence of lockdown, perhaps, I think people are just more in, 
connect uh, more in contact and more connection with uh, local spaces than they ever, they've ever been at any time. Um, and I think particularly the theme of sort of power, control and ownership is something that we've seen sort of really take front stage um, in some of the big public debates that we've had over the last few years, whether you think of that in a context of Brexit and whether you think of that in the context of some of the political discourse that we've had or, or indeed some of the big changes that have happened in the in response to lockdown and I'm thinking of things like low traffic neighborhoods and, and other active um, travel programs and so with so much of that public debate happening in um, quite adversarial spaces um, often uh, whether that's through social media platforms like uh, Facebook and Twitter and um, the reality is, is that um, how we interact with decisions and how we interact with uh, the people who control those decisions is rapidly changing too um, and so for public policymakers, um, me now, um, I sort of operate in a world in which the debate isn't just taking place in a council chamber. It's certainly not just taking place in a dusty town hall anymore. Um, it's happening in a big way and it's happening at scale. And so the question becomes, well, how do you harness the absolute sort of desire of people as the polling sort of indicates to want to be involved in that conversation? Um, how do you find a mechanism in which public policymakers um, and those working in public policy can gather that information and gather that data, make sense of it um, and use it and plug it into um, the decisions that we, we ultimately take in the public interest? Um, you know, Commonplace is one of those tools um, and um, therefore finding the processes in local government, particularly in the public sector space and particularly in planning, um, where that data can be that can be gathered. You know, at the moment, we use sort of statements of community involvement that sort of perhaps summarise the uh, traditional forms of engagement, you know, the, the exhibition or, or the public meeting. Um, but perhaps that's a self-selecting group of people who already want to be involved when we know that that debate's already happening um, massively out there. And so it's finding ways of getting people's uh, proactivity, um, their their desire, their connection, and perhaps also sometimes their anger and frustrations uh, of finding mechanisms that you can channel it into um, decisions um, and that you have a feedback loop that then demonstrates that when people said uh, that they were, uh, when people said their feelings, when they expressed their thoughts and their uh, opinions, um, that public policymakers responded, um, understood and, and fed those uh, thoughts and opinions and feelings into the decisions that they take, whether that's in local plan making or development management processes. Fantastic, yeah. And it, it, what strikes me is, as we talk about this is we're obviously we're talking a lot about um, digital engagement and online engagement, but digital exclusion is something that um, is very much talked about at the moment um, and something that we at Commonplace spend a lot of time um, and we're very heavily focused on. Um, so how do you see technology, and this is kind of a backwards question, but how do you see technology playing a role in that greater inclusion? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, um, ONS sort of thinks that um, about 92% of people um, are, are online um, and sort of pretty much everybody between the, sort of the ages of um, that they can track, i.e. sort of 16, 18, I think, um, and 44, and 44, everybody's online. And that number rapidly does decrease if you're sort of above 75. Um, uh, so sort of, um, as people do take up technology, I mean, you know, I, I still remember dial-up modems. Um, that probably ages me. Um, but the way in which technology sort of rapidly changed the way that we have done things in the last year is and nothing in comparison to how it's changed the world um, in the last 20. And that's probably only going to sort of progress as we as we get further into sort of new technological innovation. So we sort of have to be flexible and we have to adapt, but we also have to recognise that people do come on online and they do sort of pick up new technology. But the, but the, the fundamental point is is that it will only go so far, right? It's not a re, it's not a replacement for, but it's a massive augment to those traditional processes. If you can um, continue to have your town hall meetings, if you continue to have your exhibitions, if you continue to have your street stalls and your face to face engagement, that certainly helps um, sort of proactively open up a conversation with people. Um, but perhaps it does it at a time frame that they might not have time. They might be busy. Um, they might have other things on their mind and they might have many jobs or places to go and people to see. Um, but what digital technology allows you to do, particularly in these difficult conversations, 
and is to have an always on conversation um, that people can go to and that they can feel that they are meaningfully being listened to and um, and talked to and and that they're as I say their thoughts and opinions are sort of being listened to and fed into decision making. Um, now that's a challenge for technology companies like Commonplace. Um, uh, uh, but it's one in which I think all parts of the public sector and it's all, all parts of organisations helping the public sector have got a role to play. Um, you know, it's not digital first, it's um, uh, digital by default. Um, and if you operate by di digital by default and layer into that, that process, um, all of the things that you would traditionally do, uh, then I think you can actually get sort of really interesting and better outcomes for the conversations that you end up having. Yeah, absolutely. Some really, some really interesting things to think. We talk at Commonplace a lot about um, uh, digital first, but not digital only. And actually, one of the things um, I'm always impressed with how, how the uh, platform um, operates is that um, because of the data collected, um, not only can you see the conversation, who's involved in the conversation, but you can therefore see who's missing from the conversation. And that's really important because we can pull those people in and, and really make sure that you get a really fair and meaningful engagement um, through, throughout whatever, whatever subject you may be engaging on. So... Um, our Engaging for the Future report, um, I suppose to conclude, um, we, we strongly support the government's ambition to maximise engagement in planning. And our research shows that the current proposals don't go far enough to deliver um, that increased engagement. But there are, but there are clear and evidence-based solutions that already work. Um, so there is an opportunity um, to use this insight and adapt the legislation to really make engagement in planning work for everyone. Um, our, if, if you want to read uh, further, our full report, um, uh, Engaging for the Future, is available to download from the Commonplace um, website. Um, and there's just some details on the screen there. Um, please do get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, as well as planning, planning engagements, we can also run engagements around housing, climate, um, zero carbon, uh, green spaces, and a whole, whole range of other issues. So, so do reach out if, you, if you'd like to discuss further. Um, also reach out and tell us what you think of the report. We'd, we'd, we'd love to hear um, what you make of, of, of the research and, and your experience. Um, Lucy, I can't see the Q&As. Uh, have, have we got some that you want to share? We have got some questions. Uh, yes. So thank you so much, Rosa and Peter, for that insightful presentation. It's re really interesting. So thank you. Uh, we do have time for some questions. So there are a couple that have been sent through. As I mentioned, if you do have a question, please send that through now on the Q&A tab. Otherwise, you will have an opportunity to carry on the conversation later at week.digileaders.com. So there's a question here from an anonymous attendee. The move to digital is really promising, but how do you ensure you capture the views of people who are not quite as digitally literate? Uh, Rosa, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Yeah. So it's funny. This is something I was thinking about over the weekend. Um, you know, I work in digital tech. I'm I'm I like to think I'm I'm fairly digitally literate. Um, however, I'm frustrated by going to a restaurant and not being able to talk to a waiter or or someone, um, you know, to, to order food and drinks and having to do it through an app. And, and there's a lot of thought there around um, how we make sure that is possible. I think of my grandmother and I think of her um, going to a restaurant and you know what, it's not that she would go and not be able to do it, it's that she wouldn't go because she'd be afraid. So there's sli slightly off, off the point here, but there's an example of, of where we do really need to make sure um, we are being inclusive um, across the board. Um, I think we talked a little bit, Peter certainly gave some, some good responses there on how we can, how we can use technology to to make sure we are being inclusive and I think at Commonplace as I mentioned it's really that focus on looking at the data that we've collected to see who is engaging and who is being involved in in these planning de decisions or, or whatever the engagement may be around and therefore figuring out who's not involved and finding ways to target them to make sure that we do get that really um, diverse and, and meaningful voice and that, that meaningful engagement from from the whole community. Excellent. Thank you, Rosa. Peter, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, I, so I, I think about, um, you know, and I, so I do have to, uh, I think I should be very careful with the words that I use here um, with my sort of local government hat on. Um, quite often, the conversations that you have in public policy, particularly at a local government level, tend to be actually quite exclusive, right? And they tend to involve a really small number of people for whom 
um, are absolutely passionate about the built environment and change um, to place. And they've absolutely, totally 100% got a right to be involved in that, that conversation, right? Um, and, um, y- you know, I, I, uh, at some point I will retire um, and I probably will turn up to every public meeting um, that I can go to um, as a, and, you know, sort of play in my thoughts as a retired politician slash planner um, and expect everybody to take them absolutely importantly and seriously. And I'm sure people will. Um, part of the challenge, though, here is that in order to sort of get representative views, in order to sort of really have a proper understanding of um, how people interact with the world around them, we've got to sort of radically and, and, and uh, change the way that we have that conversation so that we involve far more people um, than currently involved in sort of quite static um, and quite sort of didactic um, conversations that local government has have with, um, with the public. And, you know, there'll always be a place for people who are sort of passionately involved and wants to, but we've really got to find ways of reaching out to particularly groups that don't traditionally engage. If you're younger or if you come from a minority ethnic community that doesn't necessarily feel as um, that, that a local authority speaks to um, the issues that, that, that you face, you know, we've got to find mechanisms of being able to talk to those people and really find, you know, and, and what digital technology allows you to do is to sort of open up that conversation really quickly um, and, and sort of make the process of sharing a view and an opinion so simple and quick and easy that um, you don't really have to go to the supreme amount of effort. And you don't have to be a sort of a semi-expert either. Um, and if you know that you're giving an opinion or you're sharing a view that it's being taken seriously, um uh, and sort of really sort of democratizing and opening up sort of those conversations at scale so i don't think it's necessarily a question um certainly in my mind of um digital technology perhaps excluding um people from the conversation actually it's the reverse it's about using digital technology to really rapidly open up that conversation excellent thank you i guess a, a related question then from galinda uh she's well, they've asked, um, how do you engage people that do not have adequate access to the internet? Either no access or poor quality access. It's a bit more specific. Uh, Rosa? Yeah, sure. So I can speak um, specifically from Commonplace on this. So so, so we, we have a feature within the platform um, where you can put it into a mode, um, we call it survey mode, where um, you, you could be um, a council officer or a volunteer or whoever it may be, could, could be out um, on the street engaging with people as they, they pass. Um, this th- this means that these people don't have to have access to the internet themselves or whatever it may be. They can they can engage as you would typically imagine um, from a street stall or or uh, um, you know somebody with a clipboard in the street that sort of thing. So way. Uh, the way of doing things I think is out. These we've worked with as well as obviously. Um, pushing uh, the engagement online and um, through through commonplace, but through the chats and things. Of course, that's going to reach a lot of people. But when... I think I've I've just Rose's cut off a little bit for me, Peter. Has she cut off for you? Which is sort of probably the great irony of the question, right. wasn't it? Um, <laughs> the great irony of the question about sort of poor internet connections as, as internet connections all over the country go down. Um, yeah, look, I mean, sort of my view on this is um, I think it's really important. Partly that's a sort of a bigger public policy challenge, um, probably for local government and for national government about digital connectivity about the rollout of fiber optic, about how you make sure that um, digital is sort of in every part of the country. Um, You know, we have so many conversations locally about sort of economic growth being stymied by the lack of access to sort of fiber optic um, because of the sort of increasing needs of um, the business to sort of have that sort of super fast access. Um, So I think it's, you know, I think it's going to be bigger for digital, it's going to be a much bigger conversation necessarily than I think digital um, digital, uh, sort of platforms themselves can do. Um, but you know, it's one that I think we really need to sort of properly have a think about, um, and that's easier in urban areas. Like it's much easier in a place like London uh, and Ealing to sort of have that conversation. 
Um, but you know, we've got large parts of the country, and large parts parts of the countryside to do that sort of don't have that degree of access. Um, and you know, therefore, it's incumbent upon us to sort of make that happen, um, and then to make sure then that it's not just the um, software that's working, but it's, it's not just the hardware that's working, but it's the software that can sort of work on top of that too. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, Rosa, it looks as if you've returned. Uh, I think we got about halfway through your answer uh, and then you cut off. Would you like to just begin that again? Sure, sure, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm gonna put the uh, the internet interruptions down to the heat. I think, I think it's a hardware issue. Literally everything's melting today because it's so hot. So I'm sure you're all experiencing this too. Um, oh, you've all frozen for me. So I wonder if I have too. I, I'm going to turn my video off and see if it helps. That's a good idea. We can hear you. Lucy, are you, you hear still it. hearing me? Hear you fine, yeah. yeah. Well, so I don't know where I got to, but what I was saying was, was basically we have this survey mode um, within the platform at Commonplace that allows us to, um, to, to, to turn the platform into survey mode. So people who may not have that access to the internet or maybe struggling with their internet today, like I am, um, can engage, whether this be through a traditional sort of street stall or, or um, somebody in the street with a clipboard sort of thing. Um, uh, this also means you can engage passers-by who might not have seen uh, Commonplace posted on um, social media or through the local council's website or however else it may have been promoted. Um, in addition to this, because of the way the data is collected um, and we can see who is involved in the conversation, we can also understand who's not. And some of the local authorities we've worked with um, have worked really well in uh, figuring out who those people are, whether that be by postcode, ethnicity, whatever it may be. And in some cases have done targeted um, postcard drops to inform them that the commonplace is happening and give them alternative ways of engaging if, if, uh, if digitally isn't working for them. Brilliant, thank you, Rosa. Um, so another question here, transparency is key in public engagement. If it is the developers and local authorities paying for these digital tools, how can we ensure that the data is open and transparent for everyone? So, Peter, maybe we can come to you first for this one. Yeah, huge, huge issue, right? And um, I sort of think about some of the reports that actually informed our own um, and some of the big things that have been sort of happening in the development industry that um, uh, really sort of actually sort of shown a, shone a spotlight on this. Um, Grosvenor, one of the sort of the biggest landowners in, in London and in the country, um, did a report in 2019 and they'd done their own public opinion polling. And, and that report was sort of a bit of a bombshell for, for the development world because they asked the question of the public, well, you know, sort of who do you trust to have your interests at heart in conversations um, in the built environment and in planning? Um, and sort of, you know, um, you know, I'm a politician now, so I can say, look, you know, I wasn't surprised that 2% of the public said that they trusted developers. That that sounds to me to be about right, um, you know, and perhaps sort of re reflects some of the um, conversations that happen at a very local level. Um, but the big shock, the big surprise was that only 7% of the public believed that um, local authorities had the interests of the, sort of the public at heart in the conversations that were happening about the environment. Um, our numbers sort of showed something different at Commonplace um, when we did that. Um, but we sort of really sort of deep, deep dived into some of those theories, and some of those, those uh, conversations. I think transparency is really important, right? Um, transparency is a fundamental bedrock of knowing that the decisions that are being taken in your interests are the correct ones and that they are representative of what people think, but they're also representative of the evidence that's available uh, the science that um, uh, that demonstrates um, uh, 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 what should happen, um, but also sort of that precious commodity of truth, which seems to be ebbing away, I think, uh, a little bit in the public discourse. Um, so, so, so transparency is absolutely sort of vitally important. Um, and I'll sort of probably let Rose talk a little bit about sort of um, how Commonplace uh, deals with that. Um, but I think it's going to be a, one of those themes that's only going to increase um, in the public sphere. And it's only going to increase because of technology and because of what technology allows you to do. There are many London boroughs and there are many local authorities um, who go far above and beyond um, sort of what the statutory requirements are for the transparency of data. Um, and actually, the transparency of data then helps people innovate um, because it enables people to find problems that nobody, that probably people didn't even know existed. 
um, and then sort of um, do what good technology companies do, which is to find new solutions um, and new uh, new uh, new ways of um, looking at things. And actually, you know, a local authority probably, you know, in any any given circumstance, I think, you know, in Ealing, we've sort of got something like 250 databases or 250 sets of data. They don't necessarily talk to each other. Um, but if you start to do some of the big data analytics on everything from demographic information all the way through to sort of how people are interacting with services, you probably could build a really interesting um, picture in terms of sort of making some of those changes to some of those interventions, but then also really having a proper understanding of the communities that you're serving. Uh, you know, and I think that um, make, means that we sort of have to be in the lead of setting that expectation too of the companies and the suppliers that we, that we sort of engage. Um, because actually, you know, the more people that are involved in that process of innovation and change, um, the better uh, and the better sort of public services can be at being responsive and open to what people want from their local communities. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, Rosa, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting that um, Peter brings up the Grosvenor research because that I think, well, you know, uh, yes, yes, I work in digital tech for commonplace but I'm also an elected councillor, as, as was mentioned at the beginning. And of course, that, that shocks me. Um, I think the findings in, in our commonplace um, research is that percent um, believe that the decision that decisions are made in secret. Um, that's also really worrying. Um, and that you know, just, just proves that we really do need this greater trust and transparency. Um, at Commonplace, we put a lot of focus on this, and it's one of the reasons why um, for, for most engagements we have um, the, this open commenting. So you can see, and I talked about, a bit about this in the presentation, but you can see what your neighbours think, and you can see what uh, local people think. And not only does that make more people want to engage, but it helps people understand what's going on around them. So it's about making sure that that data is pulled together and then used appropriately in the decision making. Um, another thing we see, um, particularly um, with some of the more um, contentious engagements, um, occasionally we see gaming. So we see people um, using the site um, to promote a certain uh, idea on the engagement. Um, and at Commonplace, we've got some, uh, we've got a wonderful team working behind the scenes who have built in some brilliant um, uh, anti-gaming uh, software and things that can, can help us identify that gaming and make sure that's taken out of the results of the data to make sure the data is really fair and meaningful. Great, that's really interesting, thank you. So I think we've got time for one more question. And there's another one from Galinda. How do you convince councils or councillors that the comments coming back on Commonplace are representative of the community? For example, Lambeth Council consistently argues that consultation feedback is not representative if it does not support with what they are proposing to do. For example, regeneration or LTMs. Um, so interesting question there. Uh, Rosa, do you want to take that first? Sure. Yeah. So I don't I don't know about the specific example in, in Lambeth, but I can speak sort of to the wider use of commonplace and, and the wider use of the data, particularly. And I know I keep talking about the data, but that really is the core of how how you figure out um, not only who's involved in the engagements, but what the overall sentiment is. So um, I think to answer that question, um, we, we find out um, that the that the data is correct and that the um, that the the sentiment for the consultation is is the way it is because the data proves it the data proves who we're engaging and therefore who we're missing and should be targeted and 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 hopefully that's then expanded upon by the local authority who can who can make sure they then have the more well-rounded decision uh, or, or engage decisions can be made based on that information based on those facts um so that's that, that's really important uh, just to add to that as well, Galinda said Lambeth talks about the silent majority. So, um, great. Uh, so, Peter, your any any perspective on that? Yeah, you know, so so this is where sort of technology and um, legislation and decision making sort of um, collide in a really really big way, um, and it sort of partly also speaks to. You know, to sort of go back to the beginning when we sort of talked about the planning bill um, and perhaps the way in which um, uh, legislation doesn't keep up with technology, right? So um, the 
regulations or the, the, the Road Traffic Act that govern sort of how we make decisions about um, highways and how we sort of use experimental traffic orders and transport regulation orders, traffic regulation orders, um, sort of sets a, a series of expectations about how local authorities are expected to engage with the public um, and about how sort of a statutory process of engagement should work. With the TRO, it's 21 days standard. Um, you tell people what you're doing and you give them the opportunity to object. Uh, and with an experimental traffic order, you put it in for six months and then you have an ongoing conversation uh, and then you make a decision, right? And what legislation often does is to define the solution to a problem that probably should be a bit more flexible uh, and doesn't necessarily reflect what you're able to do with modern technology. So, um, uh, uh, ultimately, what local authorities have to do when they do take decisions is they have to sort of take into consideration all the various different bits and pieces. So I think probably when Lambeth uh, and other local authorities, for that matter, have to make decisions about low traffic neighbourhoods or um, their traffic regulation or their experimental traffic orders, you know, they're effectively having to take the decision according to the law and make it sort of judicially uh, or sort of defendable against judicial review, which um, anybody who knows anything about Lambeth knows that perhaps they're they remain in court uh, at the moment, um, defending some of the decisions that they've, they've made. Um, but to sort of pivot back, ultimately, look, what this is about is um, understanding community sentiment, right? And it's another way and it's another mechanism through which people who are involved in public decision making and those who are taking decisions have the ability to understand what's happening in communities. As politicians often, like our processes, we go knocking on doors, right? Um, we do that not just election time, but sort of all year round. Um, but that's a time limited event that happens only when you can put people on doors um, outside of COVID um, so that we're not transmitting uh, or we're not acting as vectors to sort of spread. Um, what digital allows you to do is to sort of replicate that to a conversation, um, that sort of scaled conversation um, in a different way and, and to provide that sentiment and to provide the understanding of what people think, you know, um, it's one additional layer um, to sort of the big challenge of um, representative democracy and decision making that ultimately representative democracy needs to make. Um, and um, it takes place in a contested space. So, um, you know, it's a, a way of making sure that people have got the ability to sort of in, engage and in, in input and contribute to the big conversation um, and to help public policy makers and decision makers to sort of understand what they need to do. Is it going to be perfect? No, nope. uh, democracy is not perfect. Um, decision making is never going to be perfect. There are going to be winners and losers in every decision that ever gets made. Um, but it's about sort of building those platforms for compromise and building those platforms for people to come together to have that discussion. Great. I think that's a really a good comment to end on. So thank you, Peter and Rosa, for that insightful presentation. It's been really interesting. Um, so thank you. Uh, so the recording of this will be on week.digileaders.com on the same talk page that you registered on, and you'll also be emailed a link to the recording later on today. You'll be able to share that link with colleagues and watch it back at your leisure. So thank you so much again, especially to Peter and Rosa, and um, we hope to see you all soon. <laughs>